So I'm just going to jump right in and take off. In 1990, Luna Leopold, who was the first chief hydrologist of the U United States Geological Survey, argued that there's an unwritten gut feeling that the resources of the planet and of the nation are worthy of husbandry, indeed are essential to our long-term well-being. Prior to this lecture, which was the Abel Woolman lecture that Luna Leopold delivered, he had argued previously in 1977 uh, in front of the California governor at the time, Pat Brown, that water was so complex that the demands on water were so divergent that we couldn't have a philosophy of water management. There were too many cultural variables, there's too, many, too much geographic variability, too, too many dimensions of climate variability to allow us to bring all of these different contingent dynamics together. And that sort of wisdom has played out, that water management needs to seek solutions that are often second best, that make do, and that have to grapple with a lot of really conflicting ways that water use has ramped up through all sorts of direct and indirect dynamics from energy use, from food, from infrastructure directly using water, from many industrial processes and so on. And, and these sorts of graphs that are now fairly common are typical of discussions around the, what is called the great acceleration of humanity's growing rate of appropriation of Earth's material and energetic throughput that has been especially uh, fast in terms of the rise of the rate since about the just after the Second World War. This is the particular graph for water that goes from roughly 1900 to about 2010. And these sorts of graphs and variables combined with numerous accounts of water problems around the world from the empty Aral Sea to Rio de Janeiro running out of water just moments before the Olympics and various favelas and slums where water was diverted to a returning of the drought in California in 2015, then a massive, almost traumatic arrival of very serious rainfall in California this year to the point of overtopping the United States' largest dam have all given a certain amount of credence to this idea that there are a lot of variables and that these variables are so complex we don't have or can't have a kind of philosophy of water management. But I'm going to argue today that the opposite is true. I'm going to argue that we do, in fact, have a way of coordinating all of these different dimensions, and that this philosophy is quite common, and so common, in fact, that we wouldn't really normally call it that, right? but that we do, in fact, have common ways of thinking about water across the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences to some degree, although I'm going to focus today mostly on the humanities and the social sciences. And really, when I talk about the sciences, I'll be talking about not what scientists do, but the way that science is often used by social scientists. So I'll make that distinction now. And one of the reasons that I want to make this argument is that existing accounts of the Anthropocene and of this great acceleration I often argue that we've sort of stumbled into it, that humanity was going along, appropriating various elements of nature, and then, lo and behold, we became a kind of geological force, which is one of the key sort of criteria for debates around the Anthropocene. And there are common explanations for how this happens. One is that our environmental crises are rooted in some sort of deep division of society from nature, where the natural world exists as a kind of reservoir for human desires. We need something, we can go get it and the consequences of us continuing to get materials and energy have led to an overrunning of various planetary boundaries, whether it's for phosphorus, climate, what, what have you. So that's one explanation. But this explanation is not particularly satisfying, in part because eco-feminist scholars, post-colonial scholars, and indigenous scholars have been arguing that this is a problem for a long time. So it's not entirely clear why we should take the scientific account 
as the key reason to reject this, even if empirically we can say that humans are affecting the dynamic of the Earth system, so everything inside it is also affected by human impacts, which is sort of the logic of many of the claims, it still isn't entirely intellectually satisfying for these other reasons. Right? There, and a second line of argument, partially in response to the first, has argued that, there's, that the Anthropocene is the sort of way of thinking that is entirely novel and which has made, been made possible only since significant advancements in the Earth system sciences in the latter half of the 20th century. And because of this novelty, we need entirely new ways to think about the Earth system and our relationship to it. For various reasons, I also don't find this explanation all that compelling, in part because the development of the Earth system science didn't emerge out of a vacuum. We already had preconceived ideas. We already had ways of assessing the Earth system. So one of the common explanations for on this side of the ledger is by Keith Ham uh, sorry, not Clive Hamilton, who argues that there were various committees that were critical in the development of international scientific networks. One was the Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment, or SCOPE, that were key to drawing together networks of scientists to help us get this emerging picture of the Earth. And what I'll argue today and what I'll show by the end is that actually there are several key geographers who took ideas that were much older than any sort of novelty um, post-1950 could account for and brought these directly into scope itself, one of which was a very famous water management, maybe one of the most famous, uh, Gilbert White. And that the way in which our ideas of water management have been and continue to be taught even in universities has a much longer history. So I'm going to offer that alternate account. And the reason I'm trying to offer this alternate account is because as I was doing my own research, which resulted in this book, I noticed that there was a common way of talking about water in many places, a common sort of narrative that we often talk about, in Canada especially, where we critique notions that water was once abundant and we treated it as abundant, and then through various forms of mismanagement, it became scarce. And as we failed to deal with water scarcity, conflicts arose over water with the potential for political conflict or, and, and hence security concerns, or conflicts that undermined the conditions for successful societies and created environmental security concerns. And this sort of narrative of water's abundance, scarcity, and security can be found not just in Canada. It's, it's used in the United States. It's used to describe policy scenarios in Brazil, in Israel. And what I was interested in is how did this common way of thinking of accounting for very diverse scenarios, often in cases where there was no abundance to begin with, such as Israel, how did this come to be a way in which global policymakers talk about water? So that's what I'm trying to explain. This is the intellectual project. So what I'm going to talk about, for those of us who study water, which at a water institute I assume is many, is going to involve people who you may have heard of but not ever considered their philosophical views or those who maybe you haven't heard of for various reasons, part of which is because they were academic failures, but very influential politically with fairly negative consequences. So the story starts at the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC, which was founded in the home of Major John Wesley Powell in 1878, one evening, with a group of scientists and social scientists who were very worried that at the closing of the American frontier, the forms of corporate power and monopolies over resources that were largely driven by European capital were vastly, were very quickly exhausting resources that were once thought infinite, forests, bison, and so on. And they thought that they needed to, to stop this. They thought that this was, would be devastating for the American people in the long run. And they called this general problem the land problem. This was their term for it. And they identified the roots of the land problem in the institution of property. In their view, the institution of property that had been inherited from, specifically from British legal traditions, simply wasn't connected to the earth. 
right? John Locke's view of property, for instance, says to leave as much as is good for others, but it has no empirical basis in terms of what that means. And so they set out to try to give property an empirical basis. But to do that, they face a much grander challenge, which is to think of property as a social institution. And if we are going to give a social institution like this an empirical basis, then the society that has that institution also needs some sort of empirical basis. And the sort of person imagined by philosophers like Immanuel Kant and so on was more of a metaphysical subject and a subject who came, comes equipped to navigate a world of mind and matter. And they thought, we better start by getting rid of that sort of subject and having humans be understood as geological agents. And so they started to bat these ideas around, and they came up with a term called earthmaking. One of the members of the, of the Cosmos Club was Spencer Baird, who was the director of the Smithsonian. And he wrote to a very famous ecologist, or a pro prototype of an ecologist, we might say, George Perkins Marsh. And he asked Marsh, if maybe we should not think about the Earth as having produced humans, but rather as the Earth as we now find it, having been made up alongside, the hum alongside human evolution, so that humans were a landscape agent all the way down as we evolved from our Darwinian ancestors. And this idea of earth making, they began to pursue, and eventually, like any good 19th century social scientists, they decided the, the best thing to do would just be to reclassify the world. This is a much simpler starting point than going too far down these philosophical things, which they did go fairly far down. John Wesley Powell actually started a trilogy of, of, uh, on philosophy that he never finished, but all of his biographers, Donald Worcester and, and others, have all looked at this trilogy and just not even bothered. And Donald Worcester calls it a long and tangled treatise, and that's, about, that's all it gets in a biography of Powell. So I read it, and then I forgot it. It's very long and tangled. There's lots of reasons to ignore it. But what it does do is it demonstrates the commitment that he had to a certain philosophical view that was ridiculed by many others. His protege, William John McGee, was also working in the USGS with Powell at the time. And he produced this report for the Smithsonian Institute to reclassify geological phenomena, to make humans geological agents. You can see on the left-hand side, we start with geological phenomenon. And as we go up and to the right, I'll leave to the bottom, which is sort of different. As we go up and to the right, you'll see on the far right at the top, different kinds of geology that emerge from different ways in which things affect the landscape. And they thought that they had a very nifty explanation for this. They were all geologists, and they argued that geology had been too preoccupied with sedimentary layers of what had been deposited over time. They thought that's only half of geology. The other half are the processes that affect the landscape, because those affect what is deposited. So anything that affects the landscape should be counted as a geological agent. It doesn't matter if it's a glacier or a rock slide or a sheep. If it affects the landscape, it's a geo geological agent. And so here, they have combined humans, the anthropic geology, which is number seven, into this new classification system. So now they have this view of humans as a geological agent alongside everything else that affects the Earth, with whom we now share a kind of solidarity. Because none of us exists alone. We all depend on the environment. So we've gotten rid of the Kantian standalone metaphysical subject in favor of one who lives with and must inhabit life with all of these other geological agents. This is the goal. And so now they have the starting point. But now how best to actually go somewhere with this idea? Well, eventually they land upon water as the key agent for the entire Earth. Because water is the agent that bridges between non-life and life. So managing that bridge is effectively to manage the conditions for social life itself. 
And if you're managing the conditions for social life, you're not only steering evolution in ways that they considered an improvement, you're also creating the conditions for your own success. And so this they began to pursue quite vigorously, is how to manage water. And as they did, as they pursued this, W.J. McGee, who came up with that, uh, that classification system, who had a very, he's a very peculiar person. He refused to let anybody punctuate W or J, or J because he was determined to save ink. So he could only go by W.J. McGee. He also, at one point, was, uh, was walking along in Washington, and someone confused him for a clergyman. And without hesitation, he walked in and delivered a sermon. He was not a believer himself. I don't even know what religion it was. I assume Christianity, but I don't, I'm not sure. And well, that wasn't in the account. But he had this very large view of himself, let's say, and this large view of geology that he was going to now funnel into policy. W.J. McGee also happened to have co-founded the American Anthropological Association with Franz Boas. And he thought that the result of, and I won't go into detail, but the book does go into detail on this. He thought that the result of following geological evolution was this gradually enhanced capacity for the Earth to organize itself. Societies that found this out, that managed to figure out this link, were the most advanced, very conveniently at the time. But most importantly, the societies that evolved academic disciplines that could study themselves had the key. So very conveniently, anthropology sat at the top of this hierarchy. He had a huge fight with Franz Boas over this very view, which led to him being shunned more or less academically afterwards, even though he was founded the AAAs, which is still in existence today. And he had to leave, and he went to St. Louis looking for a new job where he ran the, the St. Louis World's Fair, the, the anthropological exhibits there. While he was there, he attended a, a conference on bringing a deep water port into St. Louis, which is a really key goal as they tried to grapple with the emerging railway system in St. Louis for transportation and, and goods. There, while he was at the conference, it dawned on him, in his words, like the sun coming up over the horizon in the desert, that the national development of water would be a key way in which to put all of these geological ideas into practice. And so he wrote to President Roosevelt with this idea. I said he was a very confident man. So he included in the letter both this idea and his job description that Roosevelt need only sign and return to him for him to be hired. For various reasons, Roosevelt was in a bind politically, and this seemed like a good idea. He signed it. So this brought McGee back directly into the White House. Once he was there, he set about establishing what we now know today as natural resource conservation. McGee was the first significant conservation thinker. In fact, the more famous thinkers like Gifford Pinchot describe McGee as the scientific brains behind it. We debate that later. But he was the driving intellectual force behind these ideas. And in his view, the proper stewardship of water, the one that would get us past these problems, this land problem, was to tie water to the people of the United States. Right? That, that imagined community that brought the United States into being when it uttered, we the people of the United States in the first line of the Constitution. McGee imagined this people as forming an evolutionary community that brought this particular state into being. And the institutions of that state, because it was so geologically advanced, were the best for subsequently managing water. And he argued that water ought to be the property of the people routinely, that it was a community resource. And he imbued conservation with this very idea. The ethic of conservation that we now know and re repeat often and teach to our students that the ethic is achieving the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time was a geological extension of John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism of the greatest good for the greatest number. So by adding the longest time, he sought to naturalize an American intellectual or an American liberalism by fixing up their heritage from Britain. And they always were pushing back against British thinkers like John Stuart Mill and Herbert Spencer and so on. And they actually had a, had a lot of fun with it too. They described a practice. Spencer was famous for, you know, for 
the phrase, the survival of the fittest, which they thought was an awful way to describe evolution. So they used to take turns in the Cosmos Club doing what they called Spencer smashing, where one person would lob up something Spencer said, and they would all take turns smashing it and see who could get the most rise out of everybody else. So they had a lot of fun with the ideas at the same time. And here in this quote, which is from 1911, we can see one of the ways in which McGee would sort of try to naturalize all of these things together. Right? So here he argues that as the prime necessity of life, that is the ultimate basis or for existence of individuals united in a nation. The water of a country is under that leading principle of our national existence that all men are equally entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The common and individual possession of all, but a possession in equity inalienable and indefeasible since no constituent of the nation could divest themselves without harming themselves and the nation. So we had, a, more, we had a, a way to tie the good of the community down to the rights of the individual all through this sort of geological account. And the way that McGee described this in shorthand was in a paper just two years prior to this one, that the way to sum all of this vast amounts of geological contingency together was to simply declare water a resource. And so in 1909, McGee writes the foundational paper for the conservation movement declaring water a resource. And there he articulates the utilitarian ethic that I just described. Now for various reasons, McGee's, uh, McGee's views are not accepted, although the conservation movement goes on. But they are resurrected later. The, the, part of the reason they, they, don't, they don't work out is because in 1920, the enabling legislation for the National Conservation Commission is repealed by the next government. And it's not until a more familiar set of circumstances arises that these early notions of conservation come back into the more familiar picture of water management that most of us know. In particular, the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1933 was defended intellectually by and philosophically by its second director, David Lilienthal, by hearkening back to the early conservation movement as the formative time in which water was connected to the state and to the well-being of the US. And later, as these, I'm just going to skip over this little part. My talk's a little bit binomial to try to cover everything. So this part's sort of the dip in the binomial. So later, very similar idea uh, takes place in, in post-colonial development when the Tennessee Valley Authority becomes the way to talk about international development. James C. Scott, for instance, the, the Yale historian and anthropologist, has argued that for a time to think development just was to think of the TVA. That was how prominent this model was. And advisors to later presidents, such as Lyndon Johnson, argued that in the same way that America had found a technique for breaking its colonial ties to Europe, the TVA was now able to do that internally to the nation. And they argued that until some sort of regional water development took place, the hinterlands of the West and the South would always be subservient to the financial centers of the North and the East. But that a regional or watershed scale development would be able to break what they considered a sort of colonial relationship between the hinterlands where resources come from and the financial centers where the benefits accrue. For various reasons, this um, was promoted alongside, this idea was promoted alongside US foreign policy th through the Cold War. But it also played out in a context where American domestic policy was increasingly struggling with how to deal with all of these private property owners who, in principle, as they followed liberal ideas of using water as they should see fit, were not only generating benefits for themselves, they were all re also wreaking havoc for larger watersheds like the Mississippi. And they had, through the 1940s and 50s, what was called, uh, in the words of Le Luna Leopold, the Little Waters Controversy, which, is a, which was a controversy over how to coordinate lots of small land owners who might be using water for forestry or agriculture or mining, how to coordinate all of these with respect to the cumulative impacts that they would have on their shared watershed. That was a very thorny political problem but it led to a different kind of insight. 
it led them to the insight that also, just, the, just as individuals might be collectively affecting the domestic water situation, all of the other nations around the world, as they used water, would also affect the American situation on the whole based on how the hydrological cycle might be used or affected elsewhere by land cover change, by different forms of development, and so on. And so leading uh, hydrologists like Luna Leopold together with geographers like Gilbert White designed an international water decade that they approached UNESCO to enact. And using the language of the, of the American uh, proposal, UNESCO started an international decade of hydrology in 1965 that ran until 1964. And this was a first international collaboration that the, a key um, person in the UNESCO hydrological decade, Raymond Nace, who is the author of the, of the title I'll get to in a minute, he argued that this was really the coming of age of global hydrology. This was the time in which we produced the first water atlas of the world. There's a lot of estimating in the atlas because we didn't have measurements for everywhere. But this was still the best and first quantitative assessment globally that had been achieved, largely through collaborations between American hydrologists and Russian hydrologists. So it was a very politically dynamic collaboration. And it led, the, re the results of it led to the first UN water conference in 1977 in Mar del Plata, where again Gilbert White brought all of this together in the first global assessment of world water resources and human needs. And part of, you, and part of this hydrological dynamic was that they decided not to try to judge between how water should be used, whether for communist plant state planning or Western market-based development. Instead, in Mar del Plata, they used the more generic term industrial society because the competition over industrial water use, or industrialization, I should say, wasn't limited only to water, and just using the term industrialization didn't send any red flags up for any of the states involved. So they generalized this idea of an industrial society to a whole set of states around the world in order to, start, to start generating a kind of international consensus. And the international consensus that they were generating was that water was becoming scarce with respect to the inputs needed for industrialization. And so they declared water scarce in Mar del Plata. About 12 years later in 1989, we had the first real metrics to measure it, right, which have been contested ever since, which I won't go into now. But they have this judgment at this time. And one of the things that goes along with this judgment is that if we're going to talk about industrial societies as a whole, then we need some sort of way to gather all of these different people into this story. It can't just be an American story any longer. Because to do that would simply look like some sort of imperialism or colonialism played out again. And between the 19, late 1960s and, early 19, and late 1970s, a whole cottage industry blooms around describing the histories of water and man. So this new history of hydrology that is being formed scientifically is used by economists, political scientists, geographers, anthropologists, virtually all social scientists, to retell a history of water and man where societies have always been struggling to manage water. And this naturalized a particular view of water as a resource where we didn't trace it back really any longer to its initial orientation in a particularly American ethos. <laughs> 10 years later, Gilbert White, together with Mark Lovovich, a Russian hydrologist, produced the first map of the industrial, or first graph of the accelerating demands of industrial societies on the global water system. So if we think about the very first maps that I showed of the Great Acceleration, this is the first attempt to quantify that acceleration through, the, through uh, so sort of a complicated graph. The bottom one is the one to focus on, which is the volume of river runoff polluted by wastewater. It sort of gives, gives the arc. You can see that as it goes up to 2000, they're extremely hopeful that by now we would have curtailed pollution very severely. 
The, the top graph you can see is, is about consumption. Again, they hope that there's a scenario two in which after about the year 2000, consumption dropped off significantly. But the important part of, well, there's lots of important bits to this, but what I'd like to emphasize is that they start to think about how we're affecting the condition, or how industrial societies are affecting the conditions of the Earth system itself. And issues of security have long been a concern for natural resource development all the way through into the Cold War and even prior to that, I would argue. But it starts to become a more salient topic around this time. In the late 1980s, Peter Gleick at the Pacific Institute, well now an emeritus there, publishes a paper that is one of the first to connect water resources to general circulation models of the climate. And the attempt to start to connect water to the Earth system really takes off through the 1990s. Interestingly, I think, when in, this, in the component of my argument where I said some of these ideas start to come, come have a longer history, through this same period, Gilbert White is, is for a time the chair of the Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment. While he was at the conference where this graph was first debated, he was on the steering committee with Paul Crutzen as they tried to bring together all of the demands. The title of the conference was Humans and the Transformation of the Earth, which was an explicit callback to uh, George Perkins Marsh to tie these, this long-standing consideration together. And this is a key component of what they want to do, particularly as sustainable development starts to ramp up in the, in the 1980s. By the 1987, in our common future, hydrologists and most water professionals have a very negative response to, our, to it, in part because our common future nowhere mentions water. And so they thought that the, all of this work done in the international hydrological decade and in, in, through the decade of supply and, water supply and sanitation that was in the 1980s had been given short shrift. Right? You could make this claim, I think, for basically everything in our common future. Right? It's a very general statement, so it doesn't focus on forestry, it doesn't focus on mining, it doesn't focus on water either. But needless to say, it was interpreted by the global water community, especially the International Water Resources Association, as not giving sufficient attention to water. And they wrote a blistering critique of it uh, that I can find you the citation for if you'd like. But this led this emerging global water community to redouble its efforts. Other scholars, I won't repeat it here, like Ken Konka, have described how through the 90s, efforts to integrate water management take off through largely in, with the support of sustainable development programming. And the idea of integrated water resources management is to take the watershed as a unit and to try to maximize social and economic well-being while still maintaining the vitality of ecological systems. And this was promoted widely across uh, the international development uh, institutions, spearheaded especially by the World Bank, supported by bank partnerships with various other institutions and the creation of things like the Global Water Partnership. And, and here, through these collaborations, we start to see the movement from water management into, and which is focused on sort of the points of decision making, into what we would call water governance, which is really about how the social structures and political structures of decision making are going to operate. By 2004, integrated water resources management is, at least from the World's Bank perspective, basically a dead letter. They, they start to pull back from funding these sorts of programs and start to look for other kinds. And I won't go into all of the different formats that are used, but the rise of adaptive management at about this time was also supported by the bank. It corresponded to other global scientific initiatives like the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which start to, start to take different attitudes towards the functioning of the Earth system, which start to see the Earth system as in terms of resilience, that is, in terms of the capacity to withstand disturbances while still maintaining the same identity or feedbacks in a given ecological system. 
but the wisdom that changes is that we should no longer try to think about integrating water into particular units. And this is only to say at the global level. A lot of actual jurisdictions were just starting to do this at this time. Some like in Ontario had done it for many years before with the conservation authorities, of course. But places that I was studying, like Alberta, they were just getting into this idea of watershed management about, this, about the time that the World Bank said, we don't want this anymore. The World Bank now favored something else. Instead of trying to wrap everything into one view of water, a different kind of integration or a different kind of holism would instead try to manage the connections between water and everything else. So instead of trying to draw all of the demands about water into one framework of management, the World Bank shifts its approach and searches for a different kind of holism, where rather than collecting all the variables together, which is a daunting and seemingly intractable problem given the politics of water management, it's savvier to seek to manage the connections between different sectors. This, between water and food, for instance, between the water needed to produce energy, their cumulative effects on the climate. And this takes off significantly after the global financial crisis, which was precipitated and came alongside of energy and food price, uh, price spikes in 2007 and 8. After which, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, approached world leaders in Davos at the World Economic Forum and asked them to prioritize water security. Members at Davos set up a working group on water security and they produced this book, this volume, Water Security, the Water, Energy, Food, Climate Nexus. And since that time, the nexus has rapidly ascended as a discourse through which to understand and often to teach water management and water governance. In, a, in, in the book, I go to some length to show how this sort of approach fits with the emerging trends towards financializing development, towards searching out development opportunities by trying to raise capital in global financial markets, but I won't go into that uh, too much just here. What I'd like to point out instead is something different. That is that we go in a certain sense from a particular view of geology that early 19th century thinker, or late 19th century thinkers had where they tried to think of geology as a kind of master science through which we could understand the agency of everything, anything that affected the planet. And by the time we get to our conversations around how to manage and govern water in the nexus, what we are doing is something quite similar. Right? We are thinking about water, indeed about humanity as a whole, as a new kind of geological agent. The discourses around the Anthropocene are premised on this particular claim. And my broader argument is that this philosophy doesn't look that different in many respects between earth making. The notions of water's abundance were initially tied to American liberalism by collecting all of the water together to produce a certain kind of liberal abundance. In the mid 20th century, when water was declared scarce, one of the strategic moments to declare water scarce in Mar del Plata was to start trying to give water a price and to use the price formation techniques of market societies to do so, which is a, which is a particular way to undercut state planning ways of dealing with water scarcity. Later, when we start to think about water security, the driving claim around water security is that we should start to try to manage the security of particular supply chains that are used to generate water provision to protect us from floods, but also those that are required to get food from source to consumer or energy from wherever it is located or coming in from if it's solar to those who need it. And the management of supply chains is, is another moment, I would argue, of a kind of new form of American liberalism, 
commonly called neoliberalism, but for various other thorny reasons, I'll just not go into that particular topic. Only so that I conclude, can conclude on time, not because I don't have anything to say about it, but that I think this account together offers us a kind of new Anthropocene explanation. Rather than having the problems that we're encountering be the result of a divide between society and nature, what we really have is a set of problems that emerge from a failed response to bridge that very divide. The attempt to bridge that divide through geology and our failure to arrest the naturalization of this geological solution to particular notions of American liberalism, I think offer a very important new way to think about the politics of the Anthropocene as having a history that we need to think about. Another way to consider this is if you're familiar with the planetary boundaries wheel, where there's fresh water, there's climate, and so on. Each one of those parts of the wheel has a kind of history to it. How we came to understand each of those domains have divergences to them. Some of them have divergences in the practices used and so on. So mashing them all together has another way of naturalizing a particular picture of the earth without considering the deep disciplinary and intellectual histories through which we are producing this picture of the earth system. And in my view, at least when it comes to the water section, we need to think about the way this failed response earlier continues to inflect how we get from that picture to what we ought to do. So for instance, many, for many, including myself, to think that water was a resource was often not a philosophical choice at all. It was just a natural course of events. And my argument is that, in fact, it has a deep philosophical basis within it. Even if we don't think about it or act on it in precisely that way, we should still pay attention to its implications. And paying attention to these implications implies that this novel account of human impacts is made possible to some degree by a particular cultural orientation that links the Earth system to the world. That's a sustainable development project that tries to, that starts out by saying, the Earth is one, but the world is not, depends critically on which cultural view we have of the Earth. And my argument is that when it comes to water, our particular cultural view of global hydrology has a kind of history that's, that's quite political and which has often been used to favor particular interests in the use of that science, not in, the, not in the doing of the science itself. So to conclude, my argument is fairly straightforward. There is a philosophy of water management that links culture, geography, and economics. And to understand our predicament, that is, the, the malaise of crises that affects water for many, we have to grapple with this philosophy, both its limitations and the inequalities that it produces and legitimates. And to conclude with one example of these sorts of inequalities, as, the, as this history of water management unfolds and the constant reference to treating America as a post-colonial state, there is a, a subtle but devastating counterpoint to it, which is that the American state, as well as Canada's, is premised on a kind of settler colonialism. So it's an exchange of one form of colonialism for another if you're indigenous people in Canada. So it's one of the kinds of inequalities that I think we need to confront. With that, I will conclude, and, and thank you very much.